Angel Jones is an educator, activist, and critical race scholar who uses creative methods such as hip hop and poetry to center the voices and experiences of the Black community. Her research explores the impact of racism on mental health with a focus on microaggressions and racial battle fatigue. Dr. Jones is also a public scholar who uses social media as an educational tool to increase access to academic scholarship. She is a proud first-generation college student who received a PhD in education from George Washington University with a focus on inequality in higher education, an MED and EDS in school counseling, counseling from Georgia State University, as well as a BA in political science from Syracuse University. She is also a Brooklyn native and proud Afro-Latina. Dr. Jones's talk today is titled The Power of Public Scholarship, Using Social Media to Educate and Advocate for Social Justice. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Angel Jones. Hey, y'all. Thank you for the little applause hands that are coming up from the bottom. I really appreciate y'all. Um, so like she said, I am Angel Jones. My pronouns are she, her, and Aya. I am super excited to be here. Um, I love talking about research. Um, I love challenging the academy um, and the traditional ways that we do things. Um, so I'm really excited and grateful um, for an organization that's being intentional about rethinking how we do this work. Um, so thank y'all for being here. I am untraditional and not formal. So if y'all have questions or comments while I'm presenting, um, please feel free to comment. I'm not sure if y'all are allowed to unmute and talk to me out loud, but please um, feel free to interact um, and engage throughout the chat. Um, okay, I am going to share my screen. Um, okay, so y'all heard the official long title of the talk, um, but I'm just for the purposes of this, just saying that we are talking about in general what it means to reimagine academic research, um, both how we conduct it, how we share it, um, and how we make it as accessible as possible. And I'll talk about the different ways I'm referring to um, when I say accessible. Um, I'll start with just a little bit about me and some of the things that I am interested. Um, I'm interested in mental health. My background is in counseling as a school counselor. Um, so most of the work that I do looks at the intersection of mental health and anything else, right? So I specifically look at the impacts of racism on the mental health of Black students, um, as well as staff and faculty at predominantly white institutions. As part of that, um, I look at both racial microaggressions and gendered racial microaggressions. Um, and for those who are not familiar, gendered racial microaggressions are microaggressions that don't just attack us for being Black or for being a woman, but specifically at the intersection of our multiple marginalized identity. Um, so I look at those and the impact they have on mental health, as well as something known as racial battle fatigue, um, and that, JK, um, and that is a term that was coined by my mentor, Dr. William A. Smith, um, out of the University of Utah, and it refers to both the psychological as well as the physiological consequences of experiencing racism. Um, so we look at psychological consequences, things like anxiety, depression, PTSD, but then there are also physical manifestations in our body, um, such as tension, headaches, increased blood pressure, elevated heart rates, and things like that. So my research um, focuses on that as well. I also look at anti-Blackness specifically within the Latine or Latinx community, um, and then attached to that, also looking at Afro-Latina identity development. Um, so the work that I'm pretty sure y'all read my work before this. Um, so that has looked specifically at Black women and their experiences with microaggressions. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that work today, um, but also what my current work is about, which is looking at um, Afro-Latina identity development. Um, so I'll start by just talking about the theoretical frameworks that I used for my work. Um, all of my work is rooted in critical race theory as well as critical race feminism. Um, I know C CRT is a, like a four letter word <laughs> right now um, out there in these academic streets, um, but I am a proud 
critical race scholar. Um, I also had the honor of serving as the president of the Critical Race Studies and Education Association. Um, so these are the official definitions of CRT and CRF. But the way I explain it to folks is basically what CRT is, it is a framework that allows us to acknowledge the roles that race and racism are playing within the systems in this country. Um, so I specifically look at the role that racism is playing within the educational system, but you, you can also look at it in the political system, in the legal system, in the healthcare system. Um, it just is a framework that forces us to acknowledge the role that racism is playing within different things. Um, like I said, I specifically look at CRT in education, um, and there are six tenets that are part of that. Um, the first one is that racism is, is pervasive in, in this country. It is etched into the fabric of this country, and it is everywhere. Um, CRT also engages, encourages us to challenge false dominant narratives and ideologies. Um, we value experiential knowledge, um, so we're really centering the voices and experiences of marginalized folks. Um, we are co co committed to social justice, right? So when we do our research, it is not just for the sake of knowledge, which I agree is important, um, but the goal of our research is to create meaningful change for the marginalized communities we claim to uh, want to support, um, and then making sure that we have transdisciplinary perspectives, right? So what does it look like to bring in the law, to think about history, to think about psychology and sociology and education? Like, what does it look like for us to make sure that we're being intentional about bringing in other perspectives when um, both conducting and analyzing our research? And then the importance of intersectionality, um, which is acknowledging the intersection of our multiple marginalized identities. So like, for example, when I talked about gendered racial microaggression, um, the intersection of being both Black and a woman. I go quickly through these things just to make sure I'm getting everything in. But if y'all have specific questions about CRT, I'm happy to answer them. Um, so when it comes to data collection methods, um, I did for my dissertation, um, I looked at how Black women cope with and respond to gendered racial microaggressions at a historically white institution. Um, and when it came time to think about how I wanted to collect data, um, I wanted to do focus groups. So I, I started with focus groups. I did four of them. Um, and we talked specifically about their experiences with microaggressions on campus. Um, but after the focus groups, I had the women journal for 30 days. And I chose this method for a couple of reasons. Um, one, just because of the therapeutic and healing nature of being able to write down our experiences, especially as they pertain to the trauma we experience, um, but also because some of the gaps in the literature show that because we experience microaggression on such a consistent basis, we sometimes forget some of the the things that are happening to us, whether consciously or un unconsciously, right? So having them journal allowed them a space to, to write down right away um, something that, that happened to them, how they were feeling in the moment, how they responded, if they responded. Um, and then at the end of those 30 days, I did individual in interviews with the women. Um, one, to kind of be able to talk about what they experienced in their, in, in their journals, as well as provide them with an opportunity to kind of give any follow-up from the focus group. Um, there were several of the women like, hey, I was really thinking about what we talked about in the focus group, but I realized that I, I really meant this. Or I said nothing had happened during the focus group, but then as I thought about it, I realized this. Um, and the indiv individual interviews also helped me to see how important the journaling was, because there were several times that I would ask follow-up questions about something they wrote in their journals and they completely forgot about it happening. Um, and like I said, part of that is because they experience them so often, um, but also there's this normalizing of our trauma, which happens to be one of the ways that we um, cope with racial microaggressions and other forms of racism. So that's just kind of what the methods that I have been using so far. Um, now talking about presenting my, my, my findings. Um, as a critical race scholar, I rely heavily on what is known as counter storytelling. Um, and what that is, it's a form of storytelling that is intentionally countering false in the narratives or dominant narratives. Um, like I said in the beginning, it's one of the tenets of CRT. Um, but it's important to understand that 
counter storytelling is not the same thing as fictional storytelling. So yes, we are creating the, the stories, but it is rooted in actual data and the experiences of the, um, in, in my case, in the women of the women in the research that I am doing, there are three different types of counter stories. So there's autobiographical where we're talking about our own experiences, biographical where we're talking about the experiences of, of others, and then composite storytelling, which is what I use. Um, and it's a mixture of three things. So we're taking into account what the literature already says about this particular topic. We're pulling in data from the current study, as well as my personal experiences as a researcher. So all of the stories, all the counter stories that I write are, are composite. And there are many different ways that you can write a um, counter story. Um, I have a preference for letter writing. Um, mainly because um, what, the most common response for Black women to racial microaggressions is that we don't respond at all. Um, and because of that self-silencing, I wanted to create um, or choose a method of storytelling that centers their, their voices and uh, allow them to talk back and respond in a way that they wish they had um, during that moment. So I love the idea of doing letter writing. Um, I've also done diary entries. Um, so for example, when talking about racial battle fatigue, um, I've written a diary, a diary counter story where the woman was talking about like, well, what, what is it like to deal with racism all day? What is it like to have to deal with racial microaggressions from the beginning of the day? And then kind of what that does to you as we kind of go go throughout the day. So allowing the reader to experience kind of the, the day in the life um, of a Black woman at a historically white institution. Um, they've also done as dialogues. I've done them as poems or spoken word pieces. So there are many different forms that you can use to write a counter story. But the purpose of the counter story is you are presenting the data, but you're challenging, intentionally challenging a false dominant narrative or ideology that pertains to the marginalized group that you are advocating for. Um, I'm going to share a counter story just so you can understand what it is I'm talking about. Um, the counter story is coming from my most recent um, research study, which looks at um, the factors that are impacting the identity development of Afro-Latinas. Um, there are three findings that, that came out of it that you'll kind of see or hear in the counter story. La Latinidad limits um, really talking about um, how we as Afro-Latinas are judged because of the, the color of our skin or the texture of, of our hair or our the, 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 the way we speak the, the, the Spanish language, right? So all of the things that call our Latinidad into, into question. But then the second one is also having to prove that we are Black, right? So in the Latino community, not feeling Latina enough, and then in the Black community, having to prove that that Blackness as well, which then led to the double de denial where you're feeling like you can't really find your space in, in, in either space, find your place in either space. Um, so that's just a little bit of background on the study. So you kind of understand where um, the info I got for the counter story that I'm going to read. I'm going to stop sharing um, just so you can see me and not the screen while I am reading it. Um, so the way I did this, um, um, because it's composite, I, I used data um, from the particular st uh, study where I interviewed 18 Afro-Latina women. I pulled in my own experiences as an Afro-Latina woman, and then what the current research says about our experiences. And I wrote it as a letter to our younger self. Um, here it goes. Dear Angie, before I begin this letter, let me start by telling you that you are Black, beautiful, and your Blackness is also beautiful. I need you to hear that because you live in a world that surrounds you with images that will convince you of the contrary. You will learn very early to hate parts of your body that don't align with Eurocentric standards of beauty. You will get your first relaxer at eight years old because you want to look like the girls you see on TV. You'll feel good for a little while until you realize that it's not just in white shows that you do not see yourself. You will watch novelas with mommy and Sábado Gigante with Abuelita and see lots of beautiful Latina women, but none of them will look like you. 
unless of course they're the housekeeper or the funny one. You'll also get excited about each month's new issue of La Latina Magazine because you love the idea of Latina women being celebrated, only to be disappointed when you never see women that look like you on the cover. This will cause you to constantly battle with two questions. Do I not see people that look like me because Black isn't beautiful? Or am I not considered Latina because I'm Black? Mijita, I assure you that the lack of representation you see around you has nothing to do with your beauty or Latinidad. You are beautiful, you are Latina, and the small-minded anti-Black attitudes of others will never change that. But I understand that it'll take you time to truly believe that. Because when you get to college, you'll go to Latino events on campus with your best friend, and you'll quickly notice how she is embraced by the community while you are ignored. You will feel lost because you spent your whole life in a Latino household, but won't feel at home with your Latino peers on campus. But don't worry, you'll use this as an opportunity to explore your Blackness and you'll fall in love with it. You'll meet other Afro-Latinos on campus that will not only allow you to feel seen and heard, but they will make you feel even more proud to be Latino than you ever thought possible. But be careful, because once you graduate, you'll return home to a place that isn't as proud of your Blackness as you are. For example, your decision to cut off your hair and go natural will be questioned and seen as radical. When you talk about wanting to travel to Africa, they'll try to convince you that Europe is a better idea. And when you try to explain to your family that you experience racism on a regular basis, not only will they not be able to relate, but they will also question the validity of what you're sharing. Pre prepare yourself, Miha, because one day you'll be walking down the street and you'll be harassed by a car full of white boys who will scream at you and throw things. The first object will hit you so hard in the back that it causes you to fall to the ground. And although it will hurt and leave bruises on your body, it will pale in comparison to the pain you feel when mommy asks, how do you know the attack was racial? In that moment, you'll realize that she will never know what it's like to be a Black woman. And because of that, what you share with her will always just be stories and never personal experiences. You will feel invalidated, but know that she loves you and wishes she could protect you from it all, even if she can't understand it. And as much as I would love to tell you that it'll get better, I can't. Because as I sit here and write this letter, I still struggle feeling unseen and unwanted in our community. Although I'm used to being the only Black face in academic and professional spaces, the feeling of being the feeling of being othered hits differently when you're made to feel like an outsider in a room full of Latinos. I love a community that doesn't always love me back. But I haven't let that stop me and neither will you. You are powerful beyond measure and will make a difference in the lives of many. Con amor y apoyo, a prouder version of yourself. Let me come back to the screen. It's always weird, like when I'm doing this and I can't see faces or hear reactions. So I'm just like, are people still there? I know in heart that <laughs> you are still there. Um, so that was just an example of, of a counter story, right? So in that counter story, I'm sharing many of the findings that I found in, in the study, right? So the idea of not feeling accepted or em em embraced by your, by, by your family, especially if your complexion is darker than others. Um, for me, for example, when, when, when I, I went to undergrad and a lot of uh, women talk about this in the study that they didn't feel welcome in the Latino student orgs, but then also didn't feel welcome in the black student org, right? So what is it like to not feel wanted in, in either space? Um, so although when I present my research, I do it in the traditional way of, you know, these are the themes and these are some quotes that prove my theme. Um, I always do a counter story as well, um, because I think it, one, it challenges what it can look like and should look like, um, but also because I feel like counter stories really allow us to connect on a more personal level with the women in the, in, in the study. Um, I feel like it makes them, it acknowledges and embraces their humanity, right? Like it, they're not just data, right? They, they're not just a series of quotes. They are people with emotions and feelings and experiences that have been gracious enough to share them with me and with researchers. Um, so I try to make sure that I'm doing their stories uh, as much justice as possible. Uh, okay, back to the PowerPoint. Um, okay, so that was just an example of how I present my my research. Um, so now talking about how do I make my research accessible? How do I 
put it out into the world. Um, so I am a public scholar. Um, I recently came out with my book called Street Scholar, Using Public Scholarship to Educate, Advocate, and Liberate. Um, and the purpose of this book is really to challenge the academy. It is a call to action to reimagine how we approach this work. Um, oftentimes we say that we do our research or this work for the community, but then don't make that same work accessible to the community. Um, and that is very frustrating to me. Um, and when I think about accessibility, I think about physical access to it, but I also think about, um, I don't wanna call it intellectual, um, accessibility, because it makes it sound like we're dumbing down our work. I don't believe that at all. Um, but I believe that my work is written in a way that is very co co conversational. The way I talk to y'all is how I talk to my mama and my students and my friends. And when I present, um, because I, I think it's important that we don't get caught up in jargon or trying to be elitist by, you know, speaking in a certain way. I never want to write a journal article about participants and then those same participants not be able to read it or not be able to understand it. Um, I just don't, fundamentally, I don't believe in that. Um, so those are some of the things I'm talking about in the book, but specifically I'm talking about how I've been able to use social media specifically as a way to make my work accessible um, to make sure that other folks are getting to see that. Um, so that is what the book is about. Um, and I will now kind of talk through social media. Um, social media wasn't the plan. <laughs> I will be really open and honest about that. I was not a big social media person, um, but I finished my PhD in June of 2020. Um, so at the height of the pandemic and I couldn't find a job. I applied to y'all over 50 positions and couldn't find one. Um, so after I got out of my feelings <laughs> and decided that I still had work to do, I was like, okay, I still have research that's important. I still want to educate because educating is what makes my heart beat. Um, so I realized that at the time, most of the academic um, scholars that I follow or engage with were on social media. Um, so, okay, I'm trying to, oh, job search, absolutely tough, <laughs> absolutely tough. Um, but honestly, it ended up being the best thing that's ever happened to me and I can talk about that. Um, but I was realizing that most of the, the scholars that I respect and word, work I was reading, they they were on Twitter. So I was like, okay, fine. I will finally start a Twitter account. Um, and the very first tweet I put up there went viral. It was liked, shared, reposted half a million times. Um, on Twitter, it ended up on LinkedIn, it was on Instagram, it ended up, like I was seeing it everywhere, um, which for me was important and not just for the excitement of going viral, but specifically because of the um, content of it. So I'm going to share. This was my first tweet. So this was July, 2020. Um, and it says, increasing the number of students of color at your school without also addressing the systemic racism within your institution only increases the number of students of color dealing with the psychological trauma of your racially hostile environment. So because I was talking about something that I love, that I care about, that I research, and it was getting this much attention and engagement, let me know, oh, this is something I can I can do. It got to the point where people were commenting and tagging their own institutions like, hey, this is you. Y'all might want to self, self reflect on what you're doing. Um, and then school started hitting me up to kind of do talks. Um, to I would say I don't call people out. I call them higher. Um, so this tweet allowed me to call folks higher and students decided to do that with their institutions as well. Um, so this was the start of it for me um, two and a half years ago now. Um, so what are some of the reasons I still use social media? Um, for me, it's about accessibility. So I believe um, in making my actual articles public to folks. So when I post, um, when, when I first have a journal article that gets posted or an op-ed or something like that, I'll take a screenshot of it and post it. Um, but at the time, a lot of my followers on Instagram wanted to actually re read the whole article, but didn't have access to it. Um, so I ended up posting it on ResearchGate. Um, and within the first week, um, as you can see here, it had 668 reads which we know is not typical for an academic article in an academic journal to have that many reads within one week. Um, the first week specifically, 
And for me, it was important because the majority of those people are not academics. They are not in higher ed. They are not considered traditional scholars. And for me, that is part of what made it so important and impactful. Um, I'm going to share a couple of comments that I received from folks when I posted it. This one says, gracias for sharing a method of viewing that doesn't require academic journal access. For those of us in related non-academia fields, it is so helpful. The second, thank, second one, thank you for making this article available. I'm a nursing student and the only African-American on my unit outside of one resident. I'm struggling with microaggressions, which is what that, um, the article was about. And this one says, I don't have access to these journal articles. I'm kind of broken still and cannot yet function enough to get back into higher ed. Would love to read it though, intend on healing and getting back though to work. And these are just three out of a hundred. I received. Um, and to me, it, it, it just made my heart smile, um, but then also made me sad, right? Because there's so much good work and good research and helpful researches out there that is being confined to the four walls of the ivory tower. And I just don't believe in that. We have to make this work accessible. Um, so I love that folks are being able to engage with that work um, and see themselves in, 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 in research, um, especially with things like racial battle fatigue, folks within the academy haven't really heard of it. So folks outside, of course, haven't. Um, but every time I do a talk or a workshop on racial battle fatigue, I get some version of, oh, so I'm not crazy. Oh, so it's not just me, right? So the power of being able to name something you are struggling with that is literally putting your life at risk because of the psychological and physiological consequences. Um, so shame on us if we're not being intentional about putting this work out there. How am I doing on time? Okay, not too bad. Um, okay, so that's accessibility, but then I also think about reach. Um, this is a little old now. Um, so I currently have 61,000 followers on Twitter, not Twitter, on, on Instagram, um, but then you also look at reach. So this, um, I guess data analytic on the bottom is saying, that I was able to reach 8.2 million accounts within just 30 days, right? So the powerful reach that social media has. Don't get me wrong, social media can be trash for a lot of reasons, but there is also a lot of good that can come from it. Um, when I think about reach, these are two reels um, that I did. For those who aren't I'm familiar, it's similar to a TikTok video. Um, and just example, so this reel was seen by 7.8 million people. This one was seen by 2 million people. Um, and I would say 95% of the things I post are about social justice, racial inequality, and things of that nature. So the fact that 8 million people are getting to engage with this work, to me, is huge and really important. Um, so impact factor. Obviously, uh, y'all know about the impact factor of journals, which... I have a lot of issue with, um, and I wrote an article for Inside Higher Ed in, I think, 2021, um, where I challenged the Academy, right? So we value the impact factor of a journal, but not the impact of our work, right? Like, how do we assess the impact that our work is actually having? Um, and I talk about how I've been able to use those social media. Um, and even that being an article I was nervous about, because I'm like, I'm calling the Academy out. How are they going to feel about that? And I got some, so, some pushback, but surprisingly, a lot of it was positive. And then two years later, that turned into a book. Um, so this uh, comment I got, I do not know this person in real life. Um, I never get this right because there's too many Bs. Big ball, nope, big black bald brainy bearded biker um, wrote is GWU, which is my institution at the time, getting you credit for your social media. Your impact and reach is far beyond academic journal journals. If not, tell your department chair to get at me. I promise I did not plant him. I did not tell him to write it. But when he did, I was like, yes, like people get it. Um, and within the academy, I'm also pushing for them to rethink what counts for tenure and, 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 and promotion, right? Because currently they care about which academic journals um, you've published in, right? And what the impact factor of those journals are. But there's no acknowledgement for the fact that 8 million people are engaging with my academic scholarship on a regular basis. Um, so that made me really happy that he was able to point that out. Um, so now for y'all, just some things that I want y'all to take away and think about. Um, 
why do you want to do this work, right? So when you think about your research, specifically in this type of research you want to do, what, what is your why? Um, I think a lot of folks in the academy are selfish and, self, and, and self-centered and self and their research, even though claiming to be about the greater good is not. Um, at, at their core, it really is about them. Um, so I want you to really check to check yourself. What are your motives? Why do you want to do this work? Um, who are you doing it for? Right. If you especially if we're thinking about advocating for the needs of marginalized co- communities, who 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 is your community? Right. Who is the c- community you're fighting for? What is the social justice um, issue that you are advocating for through through your work? Um, who do you want to share your work with? Um, do you just want it to be the academy? Do you want it to be single moms outside of the academy? Do you want it to be everybody who will who, who will listen, right? You need to be intentional um, about how you're putting your work out um, based on the audience that you're trying to, to reach, right? So figuring out who do you want to share your work with? And then that to me will also, it'll... It'll in, in, inform what, what, what you write, but how you write it, right? So like I said, I write in a way that is understandable to people both in and outside of the academy, right? Because I can't say that I want to share my work with high school students, right? But then not write it in a way that high school students can can understand, right? So making sure that these questions are informing the, uh, the actual work you do. And then how do you want to do it? So in, in my book and in the work I do, I specifically talk about how I use social media um, as my form of public scholarship, but it, that doesn't have to be yours. Um, I know folks that do documentaries. I know um, faculty members that, that that have their own podcasts. Um, I'm doing, I, I, I teach a class this semester on public scholarship, um, and there are folks that use artivism, like so different f- forms of art. Um, I'm part of an organization called hip hop ed, right? So what does it look like for us to use music and analyze hip hop lyrics um, to talk about, you know, our, our research and academic work? Um, so there are so many different ways for us to approach this work. There are ways that I don't know, right? Because me being right now a social media influencer, which still feels really weird to say out loud, um, right? What I'm doing now, I wouldn't even imagine two, two years ago, right? Which is why I started this by saying like, let's reimagine what is possible um, and not feel like we have to do things the way they've always been done because the world is changing and our work needs to change with it. The end. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Angel. Now we will open it up for for questions. Are there any questions in, I don't see anything in the chat. Are there, is there anything in the Q&A, Denise? Nope, nothing in the Q&A right now. Okay. Um, I, well, I have a couple of questions. Okay. <laughs> um, there are some in academia and then some that's, pretend like they're in academia that would not def- would not would say that a true scholar is somebody that has a PhD. How would you define a scholar? Um, to me, scholars have nothing to do with PhDs um, at all, which is why I involuntarily laughed as you said that, um, because it's true, right? I think folks assume that. Um, I actually... I thought my book was nearby, but I dedicated my book to to the scholars that the world often ignores, right? So to me, a scholar is someone that is educating the masses, right? That is intentional about creating change, right? So when we think about our scholarship, we're supposed to be um, addressing gaps. We're supposed to be pushing the, the field forward and whatever that means for certain folks. So to me, a scholar is someone who who is doing that. Um, so I actually have a lesson this semester where I specifically am talking about non-academic scholars, right? So like, what, what what does that look like? So I think about 
hip hop artist, right? So to me, my well, my book is root is rooted in hip hop. Every chapter is named after a hip hop song or album, and it starts with hip hop lyrics, um, which is another way to push back against the academy and what they think we should and should not do. Um, but I think about hip hop artists. Right? I think about why hip hop was created, right? And it was to advocate for social justice, right? So it brings it awareness to social justice issue right it is educating folks right they're activists right because they're activating us to do things based on the messages that that they're 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 sharing um i believe in in youth scholars right there are teenagers on social media that are doing phenomenal work at educating other teens that are uh, encouraging them to you know start protests or you know become civically engaged right so to me a scholar is not related directly to it. Like you don't have to have a PhD or doctor in front of your name to be a scholar at all. Now we did Thank have you. one question come in through the Q and A. Have you received any backlash by making your work so public, especially with critical race theory under attack? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, I mean, I am a black woman in America, so I wake up as a threat to folks plus one that is a CRT scholar and is very vocal about calling out white, white, white supremacy and anti-Blackness. Um, there actually is a chapter in my book that I talk specifically about the consequences and backlash that I experienced. Um, so being public on social media, I have gotten death threats a lot. Um, I have been called the N-word more than I can count at this point. Um, white men really want to lynch me. I get that a lot. Um, the FBI had to get involved at, at, at one point. Um, so there's a lot of that that I get. Um, so like the physical consequences, right, potentially. Um, but then of course that also has psychological consequences, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I am human, I cry, it impacts my, 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 my mental health. Um, but then it also has professional consequences. Um, there was a white man that sent an e email to my department chair and said that I should be fired um, because I don't represent the institution or blah, blah, blah. Um, but my thing is like, first of all, my page is public, right? So it's not like anything I'm writing on social media is a secret from, from, from my institution, but my institution loves that I'm a public scholar, right? Like they are, they've encouraged it. So I'm lucky or fortunate to be at an institution that isn't going to listen to to hate mail around that because they appreciate who I am as a scholar but there are plenty of institutions where I couldn't be as vocal as I am and keep my job mm -hmm. um so in the in the book I have a whole chapter about the potential the potential professional personal psychological consequences because for me it would be unethical of me to encourage folks to do this work without also letting them know the possible consequences of it. Um, so yes, I experience backlash, hatred, potential violence on, on, on a regular basis. So to that, there's a follow-up question in the Q&A. Is your current academic institution open to your public scholarship counting for tenure and promotion? Um, they would be. Um, I am a visiting professor, a visiting assistant professor, so it doesn't really matter for me right now. Um, but I am currently on the market. So if y'all know anybody, um, I'm currently on the market for a tenure track position. Um, but where where I am right now, my dean, um, Dr. Robin Hughes, is a huge pro proponent of uh, public scholarship. So she's actually working to have the operating papers rewritten or e edited to make sure that that this type of work. Um, is is valued right because I do my my work on social media, but I also do op op eds all the time. Um, I've been interviewed by Forbes and USA Today and things like that, right? Specifically talking about the work that uh, uh, aligns with with my research, right? So obviously, like it's having an impact and and it's out there. Um, and I feel like institutions just haven't caught up yet um, in terms of like what is really happening and how things can happen. Um, so yeah, but I would say the majority of institutions wouldn't count this work, but they should. Because when we look at bibliometrics, there's also alt metrics that counter, you know, factors in. So have you been tracking the alt metrics for your research as well? Mm -mm, I don't track any okay. of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think because like I make, 
and it's interesting, right? Because it, it, even like the fact that folks are reading my journal articles, like the university doesn't care what ResearchGate says, right? Like they they care how many individual downloads are happening mm-hmm. at the actual journal article. But I'm just like, but folks don't have access access to that, right? Like that's what I'm telling you, right? That that does it's so frustrating right because in my mind I'm like it's so simple like make things accessible to the people you claim to want to support but they're not ready for that academic smoke just yet but I'm gonna keep saying it and eventually <laughs> hopefully they'll, they'll they'll get on board so now what things do you do to balance that when you're faced with all of those pressures the hate mail or the hate um, tweets or the hate Instagram DMs, how do you balance that and ensure that your level set mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, et cetera? Um, therapy. Absolutely. So I see my therapist every other week. Um, I already take meds for, for, for the depression on a daily basis, but I make sure, um, that like my, my mom texts me every single day, the pill emoji and the question emoji, and then I'll respond pill, pill, pill emoji, check mark emoji. Like I am, going to be 40 years old this year and she will continue yeah. to do that every single day and I'm, I'm grateful because life is busy and I forget but like it literally the pills like right here um <laughs> so I do I do that um I have followers on Instagram but I call them sister supporters and not followers because like they hold me down um a lot if they know like because I'll, I'll post screenshots of some of the, the the hate mail I get and things like that um and they'll randomly send me 20 bucks like hey Dr. Jones this is for lunch or here's here's 10 here's 10 to 10 dollars for coffee or here's a hundred dollars for a massage um you know so, so, so that helps um I, I I take breaks from social media so, so, so sometimes it'll be a weekend sometimes it'll be a week um it hasn't been longer than a week so far but who knows it might um but then like, yes, I'll get, let's say hundreds of hate, but then I get hundreds of thousands of positive mm. messages, right? And yes, the, the hey, I wanna lynch you is gonna be a lot louder than thanks for, thanks for your work, Dr. Jones, right? Like, cause obviously, um, I think about like, there was a white woman who DMs me a couple months ago. and was like, Dr. Jones, I'm a better mom because of you. Mm. I, I am not a mom at all but like she but for her because she reads my work or on my post and engages with it she, she she believes she's a better mom there was um an, a, another mom who was driving while watching one of my I, I do um shows on, on Instagram live that are also about social justice and things like that and she was playing it in her car I'm hoping she was just listening and not watching while she was driving but I didn't ask for for specifics um uh, but she didn't realize that her son was also watching it and he started asking questions and they had this beautiful Ooh. conversation and she, she was like Dr. Jones I wouldn't have known how to even start a convo like this but we were able to have it because my son was watching it um right so things like that are what I hold on to um, and then also understanding like they wouldn't be hating so hard if I wasn't doing something right, you know? So like there, I have to do a lot of reframing, um, but yeah, some days are harder than others. I mean, there have been a lot of tears. I, I do get scared. Like, I'm not going to lie. Cause I have no idea if the man that wants to lynch me is my next door neighbor, or if he lives on the other side of the country, right? Like you really just don't know, but I love this work and I believe in it. And I'm not going to let them win. Right. So I'm going to keep doing it, but it's not for, it's not, it's not for everyone. Like I'll I'll put that out, out there. Like this work is not for everybody. Um, We have a comment in the chat um, from, I hope I'm saying this right. Kiana, I just want to say, I'm so glad you're out here doing what you're doing to make the way for people like me to come through too. I want to get my PhD and use my research to do that, to do counter storytelling for my communities, right? In plain language, keep it straight. Yes. Thank you for that. I think we also have a question from Catherine. What role do you think the open access movement and open access journals have in public scholarship? This has got me thinking about the exclusivity angle, even of those types of venues. I work with students all the time who struggle to even understand the abstracts. Um, That's so real because I get approached maybe like once a week from an open access journal asking me to to write something. 
and I struggle with that, right? Because at the end of the day, I am an academic who needs to get a job, right? And I know that folks aren't checking for those the way folks, academic people in power that can decide if I have a tenure track position or not. But then in terms of excessive accessibility, then yes, that that, that is an option. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of what they offer. Um, but I think because I am already doing so much public work, I feel like I don't have to also do that. But I think for folks who may, who maybe aren't reaching 8 million people on social media, right, but still want to make their work accessible, then absolutely, I totally, I, I totally support that. But I, I know that the admin aren't thinking about that, right? Because I've, I've met mentors that I've asked about open access, and they're just like, for for where you are in your in your career, be you know be, being an, an early career scholar and wanting to get a tenure track position, they've told me not to waste my work in in open access, and I don't think it's ever a worst a waste. But we also know how long it takes to to write an an academic article and kind of what that looks like. Um, so I've been told professionally not to do that, but personally, in terms of my public scholarship, I'm always going to put my stuff out there. I hope that sort of answered your question. Yes. Um, this was one that I have written down uh, just about how federal as well as um, several states have decided to ban TikTok. And I was just wondering your thoughts on that in relation to public scholarship, because I know that there are many educators that um, are po that post TikToks and it's another and it's just another avenue. Wait, why do they ban TikTok? Uh, they think it's like a security issue. Um, it's been used in China to actually track individuals and who they were with at different points in times. Okay. Um, well, I mean. I don't use TikTok, but there are plenty of, of educators that do. But it's gotten to the point where folks will do TikTok content and put it on Instagram, right? So I watch TikToks all the time, but not on TikTok. Like I watch them on Instagram. Um, I mean, I don't know the behind the scenes tracking information, but for educational purposes, I think it's amazing. Um, I think about consciously, if y'all are familiar with him on TikTok, he has 2 million followers. Um, and his whole tagline is education is Eleve, elevation and he's actually going to be a, a, a guest speaker in my public scholarship class next week right so he does amazing work but he does put that work on Instagram as well but TikTok seems to have a bigger reach um I don't know that because I don't I'm not on it for example but he has two two million followers on TikTok and then 283,000 on on Instagram which obviously is not a small number but in comparison to those two million on TikTok um and to me it minimizes accessibility to teenagers, right? Because teenagers are the ones that are watching TikTok and, and learning from, from TikTok. So that there are more K-12 students on TikTok than there are on Instagram. Um, I don't believe that social media should be banned, but there needs to be edu education around it, right? Like there needs to be boundary set when it comes to social media because it can be a trash place. It can be dangerous mentally, emotionally um so yeah i i still believe in the power of social media but it has to be done the right way thank you mm -hmm. so now looking back at your own research journey what would you say are a couple of do's and don'ts um okay there's also a question in the q a that i will answer and then Right. Yes, I didn't. I didn't answer that one yet. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Can you ask me that question again, Denise? Looking I was back trying to you. read and listen at the same time, and I'm not very good at that. Apparently. <laughs> I promise you, I'll read that one next. I was like, it's okay. <laughs> when you look at your own research journey, what are a couple of do's and don'ts that you would give? Mm, do's and don'ts. Um, do what you're passionate about. Um, and I tell that to, to, to my students, especially my students who are doing uh, the, their dissertation or doc programs, um, doing research is not easy. When you are knee deep in 75 articles, right, you want them to be about a topic that you actually care about. Um, and to me, the best part of research is the data collection process. I'm a 
qualitative researcher, quant makes my stomach hurt. Um, but like once I get to sit there with folks and wh whether it's a focus group or doing an interview, like that is what makes me happy. Um, but doing work that you're passionate about really makes it so much better. Um, it really makes all the hard work that comes with research and writing and presenting so much better and so much more fulfilling um, when it's something that, that you're passionate about. Um, what not to do. Um, I would say don't, don't get caught up in the academic hype, right, of what your work should look like, um, which journal you should be publishing in versus not, um, not judging the quality of your work on whether or not your paper presentation got, got accepted, you know, to a conference, which is really hard at first, right? Like, so if you get to, to denied from a conference or denied from a journal, um, I think we automatically assume, oh, it's because the the work isn't good, and that and that, that that's just not true. Um, I think when you decide for yourself, what does success look like for you know for, for for your research? What does it look like for your work to be effective? If you define that for yourself, um, I think it allows you to receive what's happening in a healthier way. Um, so yeah, do what you're passionate about and don't get caught up in the academic hype or hoopla. Okay. So now so many pundits have been talking recently about the demise of social media, and it does feel like a lot of people have left, especially Twitter. How do you think this will affect public scholarship? Are you seeing this as well? Um, yeah. So a lot of people left Twitter um, when Elon took over. Um, a lot of those people have come back. Um, I think, and, and a lot of people asked me originally, like when folks started leaving and Elon came on board, like, are you going to stay on Twitter, you know, given what's happening? Um, and for me, the idea of using their platform for the complete opposite of what they are intending it for is a beautiful thing, right? <laughs> like as racist and white supremacist, you know, these, the, these things are like, I'm literally using it for the complete opposite. Um, so I have no intention of leaving Twitter because of that, because I'm able to do really good work on it and with it. Um, honestly, I do have a fear that like one day social media will just disappear completely. Um, and then I think for me, the fear is just like, okay, so then how do I still do this work? Right. So like, I literally like y'all, like sometimes when you log into Instagram, you won't see any, any posts. And it's like for a second. And then like, it comes back on my fear is like, I'm going to go on and it literally has wiped out. Um, two and a half years of work. And then I'm just like, so how do I then move? Like, how do I, and of course we'll figure some, some something else out, but like, I love how accessible um, social media allows me to make this work, but it, it, it does make me nervous. So maybe I need a backup plan, y'all. This is what, is, start what am I going to do? You got to yes. start archiving it. You got to archive okay. your content. You know what you're, and there actually is a button, not a button, but there's something you can do in your Instagram account where it like mm -hmm. downloads it onto your computer. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do it last time and they were like, this is the wrong, the, the, the wrong password. And I was like, how do I not know my own password? And then like, I just got distracted and then didn't do it. No, Today, that's when you change your password and you have yeah. to like, <laughs> Amen. Okay, you can do this. Today, <laughs> today y'all, I, I will do that. <laughs> And so the next question, how do you balance your work life and your personal life? Do you do you social media outside of your regular work hours? And if you do, how do you motiv motivate yourself to do so? I think it's cute that y'all think I have a personal life. Um, I think <laughs> for me, um, I think so like, you know, there are some folks that have a pro professional uh, Instagram and then like a personal Instagram. My life is so public um, that like everything I do, that's why I said like 95% of my stuff is social justice. Sometimes it'll just be fun educational stuff. So for example, two of my students were teaching each other how to do the kid and play dance. I don't know if y'all are old school and know that like in the, in, in the middle of class, right? And I use that as a teachable moment to talk about, you know, joy in the classroom and things like that. Um, but I think for me, I, I'm learning to separate, right? Because I think, because every time something happens in the world, I'll get a message or a DM like, hey, Dr. Jones, what do you think about this? Or I'll get 
reprimanded like oh well this happened a week ago and you and you 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 haven't posted about this so you obviously don't I'm just like y'all first of all I'm not getting paid to do any of this second of all I am not CNN right like I cannot and don't have to high key right post about every single thing that happens um but I used to take that on and be like no 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 no, I have to like I was in Italy in November and one of the trash things happened in the country I don't even remember what happened here at the time but like I was posting about it at like two o'clock in the morning uh, Italy time and my, my best friend was like what are you doing like somebody else can do that work right so I think that's been helping me like I only open Instagram when I actually want to engage because it can it can be draining um so I am learning to have more of a personal life still makes it sound more exciting than I feel like <laughs> it is for me currently. Um, but yes, I am learning to separate because there are people in my life that are holding me accountable and forcing me to separate the two. But check in with me in a month. Let's see if I'm any better at that. So now, have you thought about disseminating your scholarship via podcasts? That could be the post-social media format for you. Um, yes. So I've been guest. I've been a guest on several podcasts. Um, and then also I am, I literally was just talking about this yesterday about getting my life together to do a podcast. Um, so I used to do a weekly show on Instagram live called Counter Story, where I used to have different guests on, different scholars, right? So they can talk about their work and make it more accessible to folks. And all I have to do is download the audio for that and then upload it to a podcast and then poof, it would be done. I don't have time, y'all. Like, I just don't, I like, I, I know, like, it sounds, it probably take me half an hour, right? To download it, upload it, and do the thing, but it's just not a priority. Um, but I was just telling a friend yesterday that I'm going to be starting a new show on Instagram Live, kind of related to what I was just talking about. Like, folks want my take on all of these things, and I can't post about everything. So, like, all right, so well, well, once a week, I'll talk about all the trash things that happened in our world. Um, so, like, okay, this time, it's going to be a podcast, right? So, I'll do, I'll do my live, which is video the way it normally is, and then I will download the audio and upload it to podcast. That's the goal, y'all. I don't know if it's actually... Maybe I'll can't hire a student. Uh, oh, y'all, y- y- y'all can talk about me. Um, no, I can't because I have like three videos from last year I still need to edit for one organization that I'm in. And I actually reached out to a media, um, one of the master's media students who's a videographer on the slide. <laughs> he never responded. So um, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's gonna, yeah. So I'm going to give myself the first two weeks. And if I don't upload those, then I'm just going to hire a student because they can do that stuff mm-hmm. super quick. Oh um, it's because yeah. like my, like it, it doesn't need to be edited. Like it literally is just the direct audio up. It sounds so simple, right? When I say it like that, y'all, and I haven't done it. It's fine. I'll get, I'll get there. Can't say a word. I'm perfectionist. I'm editing the ums and the ahs. It's, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I stutter, so everything everything I do is a um and a ah, so I don't I don't time to edit that stuff out. Any other questions? Do not see anything in the oh, Brian oh. just has one. How has COVID impacted your scholarly work? Uh, I would say that. COVID is part of why I'm a social media influencer at this point, right? So when I talked about not being able to find a job and saying that it's the best thing that ever happened to me, like I wouldn't have found my unapologetic voice, right? I wouldn't be doing the work that I do now because I would have been under the thumb and under the gaze of academia, right? So had I gone straight into a tenure track faculty position right after I graduated, like I would have fell in line and did what I was supposed to do. but I am a wildly different person now, scholar, activist, advocate, all of those things um, because the world got turned upside down. Um, and then also because folks were inside, they turned to social media. Um, so not only was I able to educate folks, I've been educated on so many different things because of social justice advocates that, that I follow on social media. And I, I was able to build partnerships um, and friendships and beautiful things with other people across the country um, that are doing this work that I never would have gotten to to meet or, or engage with. And now that the world is 
opening up, I guess it is. Like I, I finally am meeting these people in real life and like hugging them and squeezing them. And these are people that I've been working with on social media, doing workshops and things like that for two years, but have never met. Um, so COVID is trash. Let me put that out there. But the benefits that I have gotten because we were inside um, have been incredible. Like I can't even imagine what my life would be like right now had I gotten a job two, two years ago. And now here I am again, trying to find another job, but this is going to be different. Y'all. It's going to be different. Saying, have you thought about starting your own nonprofit? Um, I've been thinking about a lot of things, y'all. I don't, because I mean, I do, I do con, con, consulting work. So kind, so kind of like what we're doing now. So I do talks across the country. And now that the book is out, I'm doing book talks. So I'm like, I could do that full time. Um, and then like focus on writing more op-eds and writing more books. Um, so that is an opportunity, a potential opportunity, but I know me, I need to at least adjunct. Like I said, teaching makes my heart go pitter patter. Like I need it. I need to be in the classroom. Um, but I would totally be fine being an adjunct as long as my bills are getting paid with something else. Um, not that faculty money really pays a lot of, anyway, that's a different talk for a different day. Um, but yeah, depends so- on the field, depends on the field STEM. Um, yeah. Cause this, edu- <laughs> this education field um it, you know what's sad is that so I have master's students right now so they're in higher ed and student affairs so they're a, a, applying for jobs and when they come to me and complain about the starting salary of these jobs and they're more than I make right now when I tell you I want to throw something across the room but it's fine because I get to wake up every day and do something that I love just have a sign yeah, in your we'll office see. that you say shut up yes. <laughs> that's a first gen pro- that's a first wait no not first gen that's a um first world thank you <laughs> it's but yeah so i'm i'm optimistic that i will be doing whatever it is i'm supposed to be doing i just have no idea what life is going to look like for me in six months but that's okay So I found the letter a very powerful way to communicate your findings. Can you talk more about the process of creating and sharing those as a part of your work? Mm -hmm. Um, So what I do is I typically will pick a specific incident from one of the participants and then kind of build around it. Um, So, okay, so did did I send y'all my articles ahead of time for them to read? I don't remember if that happened or not. Um, But for example, there's one, the article is called Letters to Their Attackers. Um, Right. And then in the in in the letter, um, it's it's around the theme of why black women don't respond to to microaggressions. Um, And in it, in the letter, I think I think the composite character's name is Maya, and she's writing a letter to the white boy who micro aggressed her. Um, But the actual incident that I surrounded the letter about happened to one of the women in the in the study. So for her, she was in I want to say it it, it was a STEM class um, and they they had a test that day and she was wearing um, this beautiful African head wrap that 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 her mom, her mom made by hand and it's kind of like her her good luck charm. Um, And when she she walks into class and walks by a table full of white boys, they started singing the song from the, the Lion King as they saw her walk by. Um, So I centered the letter on that. Um, But then when she explains the reasons why she didn't respond, those were reasons that several of the women mentioned as to why they don't respond to microaggressions, right? So the main issue, not the main issue, the main incident was one person, but then I kind of fill in the letter with other parts of their stories and other things that are shared. Thank you for sharing the article, Denise. Oh, you're totally welcome. I know I'm I'm over time and y'all are supposed to do your reflective thing, but I'm happy to keep answering questions if y'all have any. Oh, no, it's fine. I was just going to ask about um, how you select which, um, which journals to submit um to, to submit manuscripts to um so tip i mean in higher ed we have our like top ones that most folks do um but i tend to look at which journals 
have published work that is similar to mine, um, especially as a CRT scholar and someone who uses counter storytelling, not every journal is going to rock with that. Um, so, so that kind of makes it hard and you know how long the review process takes. I'm not going to submit my art, my manuscript and then wait six months for them to tell me no, right? When I, you know, so I try to submit to ones that I know are more open. Um, but I do sometimes submit without a counter story. So for example, I have a, an article coming out hopefully in the next month or two, once the journal gets their life together with the, the journal of black of black psychology right so the psych people even getting them to do crt was a lot a counter story they just weren't ready for um right so i tried to do it based on similar articles that have already been published in those things um but then also in spaces that i think are Im Im important right so i submitted um so the ne the negro no the journal of negro education um, is is a big deal in, in in our community because they were rocking with us when a lot of other journals weren't, right? So although the academy might not value that as much, I do, right? And I honor them and the work that they've done for our community. So I am going to submit to them because of that, right? As opposed to, let, let me just write down the journals with the highest impact factors, right? And then do it that way. I don't do it that way because I don't care about the impact factor. Okay. Thank you. All right. And Marie has um shared the link to to um Dr. Jones' website. And I don't see any other questions. All right, friends. Are we ready to wrap for the day then? You're tired. You've been talking a long time. Thank you very much for your time today. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you to Dr. Jones and our moderators. Can we get some applause for them in the chat or use the, the emojis? Um, we'd like to thank Loyola Marymount University for its support of the Institute for Research Design and Librarianship. We'd also like to thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services for its consistent support of IRDL since 2014. Um, thank you to the team that labored put to, to put together this learning event, and we look forward to learning alongside you at our next one. So with that, let's go ahead and end for the day, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.